I am so excited to have you. Um, thank you guys for all of you that have joined and for all of you guys that are going to watch. Um, I we it, This is kind of like an informal, I said, come in your jammies. Um, our election is on um, our primary, our, we have a big election in California on June 7th. And I know it's all happened fast. And um, a lot of you guys might be like myself and we are just into June and the first five months of this year have been wild and crazy. And maybe you just have hardly had a chance to see what's going on. You got your election ballot, you got everything. So um, I'm just kind of bringing this informal. I'm Jody Gambino. Those that don't know me, um, I am born and raised in California. I actually grew up where Jenny Ray lives now in Redding, California. That's my hometown. Um, I always love seeing um, somebody from way up what I call true Northern California really um, going to try to make a difference in California because a lot of times Northern California, way up there, everybody doesn't necessarily know you. Um, but what I, as I enter introduce my guest, which is, um, she is one of the top governor of California um, candidates, because we are actually making an election in the primary. Um, she is a Republican candidate, because I know it is a primary. So if you're independent or you're Republican, um, you can definitely still vote if you haven't voted. But I- And a Democrat. You, Democrats could vote too for me. Oh, all right. Yeah. So um, without further- And have. <laughs> and they have. Uh -huh. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Um, and so I want to introduce you to her. And I felt like I'm just the type of person that likes to to backstory a little. And so I actually the first time I saw Ginny, I have um, a friend that lives up in Reading. And when the recall happened, she posted in her story um, this lady, and it was Jenny Ray that was going as candidate. And I, you know, I, I told Jenny this, so I hope that she's not offended. But everything happened fast, and I saw Larry Elder. So, like uh, me and several of my friends, we were talking about the fact, you know, um, even before this happened, maybe it's time that we become part of the solution. You know, we've always been the, the business people, the working hard, you know, okay, yeah, that politics thing isn't for us, but maybe we need to be asking God, like, what's the solution? So I personally have always felt like it's my um, responsibility to watch all debates, le learn the things, you know, before I vote. I watch both sides because, you know, I, I want to know what's going on. So anyway, I saw Jenny and what really Jenny Ray what stood out to me was number one that she is a businesswoman and entrepreneur but better than that when she started to speak her solutions and ideas for what to do I was like everyone else was just talking about the other party kind of putting other people down but they didn't have tangible like if you were put in the office tomorrow what would you do to fix some of our problems? And I was like so impressed by what Jenny Ray said. Then advanced to the end of um, February and I was in a three-day um, business conference, uh, Christian business conference up in Reading called Heaven in Business. And I heard the um, speaker who had set up Andy Mason, he called out her name and I'm like, I just heard this prompting and um, God kind of say, go meet her. And um, I walked over there and it was kind of awkward because I'm, a, even though people would think I'm not shy when I have to kind of be bold and stand there when it might feel like somebody doesn't see you or doesn't want to see you. So Jenny was talking to people at a table and she didn't see me and God kept saying, stand there. And I'm like, Oh my goodness. And so I finally did. And she turned around. And this is why I'm hosting this because um, I've met many political people in, in, through, my, through my lifetime. But she turned around and she was just an everyday person that was gracious, that stopped what she was doing, that was like, hi, here's my number. I'd love to connect with you. Not in a, I've been around people that it's very sales or got, like pushy or political, but she was just genuine. Like, and she was like, I can't believe that you've been praying for me. And she was so humble. And so I, um, I just wanted to do this um, to introduce Jenny Ray LaRoe. 
at LaRue, LaRue, LaRue. I, I told her, I said, I always, I just call her Ginny Ray because I just love it. Um, but I want to introduce you. And why don't you just start by just telling us a little bit about your personal side? I always think that it's great to know about number one, uh, one fact I find interesting is kind of where you grew up and where you are now and how I'm a California born and raised girl. So I have a passion for California and, um, and, and I kind of that crazy one that I feel like I'm not supposed to leave, but then I'm supposed to, you know, not just pray, but, but be the help however God wants to use me. So Ginny, go ahead and just um, share a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and give you full screen and then I'll pop myself back on. It sounds awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jody, for that really warm and gracious introduction. I'm Jenny Ray LaRue, and I am not a politician. I'm a business person coming into the space. And I'll just give a little bit of background. I spent 10 years in the corporate world. I have an undergrad degree in economics from the University of Virginia and an MBA from Columbia Business School. And I worked with some of the world's top companies. And during that time, I became a transformation and growth expert. So I would go into organizations the size of the state of California, figure out how out of the hundred things that we could do to make the company better, how to pick the top two or three, and then how to really execute on those. And that's, I think, one of the really critical things that's missing in California today is the ability for somebody to manage and lead an organization. We have people that can win elections, but not govern. And you can see that really evidenced inside our state. Um, the second 10 years of my life, I had the opportunity to buy a business and I was working for it. I didn't believe in the way that the leadership was taking the business and I planned to quit. And on my quitting meeting morning, I woke up and I felt I had a thought. I feel like it might've been a God thought, but it was buy the business from the guy instead of quitting. And so in my quitting meeting, I offered to buy the business from him and figured if he said no, I could quit anyhow. And uh, I, um, I, I ended up doing that. So uh, just so six weeks before my first son was born, I completed the purchase of that business. At the time it was a small business. Now it's a large international tech company with three divisions. And I'm really proud of the growth that I've built, not just for my company, but also for many other companies around the world. Uh, I am a really passionate mama. So I have three little boys, ages nine, five, and three. My two oldest are in public school in California. They're in a public charter school that is a Spanish immersion program. So we're Remarkably, they are fluent in Spanish. And um, the, our, our school has a super neat culture. We have a very close relationship with our local board. Um, and we also get exposure to a lot of the drama and the challenges of being in a California school. So I'm happy to share a little bit about that. Uh, my husband and I have been married for 13 years, going on 14, and our um, you know marriage has been uh, really rich and challenging. We are super different, and I'm really grateful for that right now. If he and I were both trying to run for office or compete to be CEOs of our own companies, it would be a challenge. Um, but my husband runs a uh, company that manages rental properties, and um, he also handles our farm. We have a 181 acre family farm in Northern California, and so. Um, um, he's our animal guy, our tree guy, our tractor guy, our uh, tool guy, and I'm the one who is, you know, on the computer traveling around the state, uh, building the future. And so, um, so uh, when somebody asked me at one point, what do I do to decompress? I put my hands in the dirt, right? I have a garden. I love to grow things. Um, and I used to be really, really bad at it, like black thumb level, right? Not able to grow a damn thing. And now I am... <laughs> thrilled to say that I can grow things and it takes practice and time, but, um, but, but, you know, ultimately I just wanted to share some of that background so that, you know, that for most of my life, I actually did not do Jody, what you said before, I did not like spend time watching every candidate and getting ready for a primary election. I was the person that was like, oh, this ballot's really hard. I'm, I'll fill out a little bit of it, but I'm not sure I'm going to do a lot of work on it. Um, I'll, I'll vote in the uh, every general election, but the primary, that's hard work. And now um, I felt like I was nudged into the government space about five years ago, kind of woken up into how important it is. And part of that is that 
everything that I do in California has been increasingly encroached on by our government. And I'll just explain. Our farm, when we first bought it, was thriving, super, you know, super great. Now we have challenges with wildfire and wildfire management around our farm. And so we have to pack go bags. We sleep in our clothes and we pack emergency bags every summer that we keep in our house so that if in the middle of the night, a wildfire comes up in the land around us that we don't manage, we have escape routes and we do escape practices on our farm. We never had to do that before. Uh, we have water issues on our farm as well. And this year we're heavily restricted for what we're able to water. Well, trees don't really care whether there's a drought or not. They need to drink the same amount of water every year. And so we have real issues and challenges that we face. My kids being in public school, that's one of the challenges that we face in the state. We feel like we're constantly pushing back against a state that wants to wedge itself between parents and their kids. And we want full access to the curriculum that's being taught in the school. We don't want our kids to go to school on days that they're teaching stuff that we don't want them to hear about. And so we really care about that as well. And then I have a business and every year it gets harder to run a business and more expensive to run a business in California. It gets more expensive to have employees. It gets more challenging to have contractors in our business. And the state of California is coming after us in every single way. And and so about five years ago, I really felt like God was nudging me, leading me um, into a new thing. And the way that I knew that is that he gave me a word. And I just want to start by saying that over 20 years ago, he led me into business with a similar kind of word. That's how I recognized it as something really significant. But the, what he said 20 years ago to me was business is the primary way I reveal my creativity on the earth. And I was so moved by that because I was, I had come out of a public university and even though I was a conservative in values, I was really a socialist economically um, because that's kind of what was taught in the vein of the school system that I was in. And when God said business is the primary way that he reveals this creativity on the earth, I thought, wow, if God loves business, maybe I should too. And it really led me to a love of business and also an understanding, which I've been unpacking for 20 years, which is, wow, if business people are problem solvers? How do we unleash them instead of hamstringing them? How do we stop making their fees $800 a year and giving them nothing in return, right? Just really practically in California. So, um, so the second earthquake uh, that God said to me was, he said, I love government, but I hate politics. And Jody, when you were speaking earlier and talking about the, the kind of way that most people operate in this space, that has been a conscious decision for me to make a difference between being a politician and a governor, somebody who wants to govern um, instead of political. And, uh, and I think that that's something that God really wants to lead us back to in America and, and beyond today are people that care about governing, not about politics. And there is a lot of strategy in the, in the um, election process. And there is a lot of strategy in the way that you get things done to pass laws and to get good things completed. But ultimately, if the heart is for politics, which leads to wanting to stay in power, then we have a problem. If the heart is for governing, which is laying down your life and your agenda to serve the people that you've signed up to serve and taken an oath of office to serve, then we're in a hugely different place. And so that has been my pursuit. And I really thought that for the majority of my time, um, in, you know, in, in this season that I would have another 20 years to explore what that looked like the same way that I did in business and um, imagine my surprise when I felt like God said, hey, I've prepared you for this. And by the way, run for governor of California, right? The fifth largest economy in the world, the hugest state in the country. Uh, one of the, and, and, and by the way, as a Republican, right? An insurmountable, as many people would say, challenge and impossible task. Um, and I said back to the Lord, if you ask me to do this, I will lose everything. And you've given it all to me. We have a business and a farm and a thriving private family life and the ability to travel wherever and whenever we want to go. I've visited 57 countries in the world. I take it, teach it over 60 universities a year on growth and business. And, and I thought this, I am living the life like 
and you gave it to me. Why would you ask me to lay all that down? Um, and the Lord's response to me was, you will, you will lose everything. That's what it takes to become a public servant. And that was how I knew that he was in this because it wasn't like, Hey, I promise you the moon and you'll have the stars too. And everything will be glowing and fancy. It was like, no, this will require a cost for you of everything that you've ever actually built up to hold dear. And he told me that I could keep two things. We could keep the farm and we can keep the family and that he would preserve both of those. Um, and, and everything else was on the table. My business our you know, success in, in every other realm. And, um, and so I laid it down and uh, I turned over my company to uh, run in the recall election. And um, I raised about a million dollars. I made some amazing headway, but I did not finish as the top candidate. It was um, you know, frustrating to me. And also Gavin Newsom prevailed in the recall last year. And so when it came around to running again for 2022, I you know, went back and I said, hey, um, you know, there was a little bit of a shellacking last year. Uh, God, what do you think about that? Um, you know, I'm thinking maybe I'm going to wait out this next season. Maybe I'll write a check to somebody else. Um, maybe I'll build the infrastructure that we would need to do something different. Um, and God's response to me was, you're thinking about your political future. And I'm thinking about California, which one of us is right. Wow. And um, so I said, well, you right? <laughs> Always. I, I, that's a, that's a good uh, default question. But, um, but I, I made the decision to abandon pure political strategy, which is, you know, run only in races that you know that you can win, enter them only when you know that you'll be the front runner. Um, and I, I decided to run this race out of obedience and out of passion for our state. And that's where I am today. So I, you know, I, I know Jody. I'm going to go back to you and I want to take your specific questions, but just as a background, I am in this all the way. I, I will not stop until I am directly instructed uh, to do it because I have caught a vision for governance and I've caught a vision for our state that I feel is urgent that I don't think can wait for political people to be ready for it. And I don't think that now is the time for us to abandon our work that we need to do. I think that primary elections are so important. And I just, I, I wanna say something about this election before we talk about issues, because I wanna check the boxes on everybody's issues. But, um, but this election is really between me and a career politician. And he is a nice enough guy, but he will not inspire the the state or the nation at the level that we need to in order to take Gavin Newsom out of office. Um, we need to inspire Hispanic voters, women voters, suburban moms, um, highly educated voters, tech company executives to get behind this movement to move California in a prosperous direction. And as a career politician, he does politics, not governance. And so Gavin Newsom has actually put a few million dollars promoting my opponent because he knows that he will save himself millions and millions and millions of dollars in the fall if he can get him through the primary. And that kind of political shenanigan happens all the time. It is perfectly legal. I mean, you, you don't have to spend your money on yourself. You can spend it on somebody else. Um, but I just want to say that, you know, if you're listening to this, I think that the primary election is where the election is won or lost. And that's why now it matters to me to vote. It matters to vote right. It matters to vote in a way that you believe you're putting somebody against an opponent or against another likely candidate. I mean, Newsom, I think with almost certainty will be one of the two candidates in the election. Um, but, but, you know, whoever you vote for will become that second place finisher that goes against him. And that will make all the difference in the fall. So with that, I'll turn it back to you and I'll let you ask me about specific issues so that we can dive into those. Um, but that's just a little bit about me, about my heart, about my passion um, for the state and some of the things that I'm fighting for. Wow. Oh my goodness. I, I really love so much that you've addressed and how you broke down the difference between governance and political. Um, Cause I, I think that there are many people in our state that are kind of like, I, we hear it all the time, like, like a, 
okay, I guess we'll just have to move out of here. And um, so I think that there's a lot of people in our state that are a little um, discouraged, but I love hearing about your story. And, um, you know, I'm, we met at a Christian business event and, and, and I really do believe that um, part of my um, business now, I just retired as a financial advisor after 25 years in the industry because I started having doors open to help people in a different way, but I've always helped the small business people. And I'd say small do, you know, when you say small business and especially in a state like California, I'm talking businesses that, you know, bring in millions and millions of revenue to the small person. But um, I've seen a lot of things behind the scenes and know what it, I'm a personal business owner, entrepreneur. I probably my overhead and some of it's not quite affected as much as other people, but I help so many people through the years. And even now um, I have, you know, California based companies that have been popping up, whether they're trucking companies. And so the gas prices, all these things really um, affect them. But to me personally, I am a faithful person. I am a Christian and um, I do, I believe, you know, I hear from God. I love what you said, the nudges, because that's not normally what it looks like. Not necessarily is it, Jody, thus saith the Lord. But even us doing this, I said to you, okay, I, I don't know. I really, I sent her a message like on Thursday and I was like, I'm rooting for you. I don't even know if this would make sense. She's like, let's do it. Let's try. Yeah, and let's to, do it. yeah, to me, that's what we need right now is someone that is willing to have that willingness. But what always stood out to me from the minute I met her, both saw her speak, but also when I met you in person, by the way, you had not announced you were going for governor. And I didn't even know you were. As a matter of fact, it was like a little secret. And I was like, yeah, I think you announced like the next um, week or two that you exactly to go yep. for it. And um, I have been, so first of all, if you see this, pray for her somewhat, you know, we all are called it to make a difference. And when we're Christians, we are called to, to, to make an impact and to serve in however God has designed us and given us a call and assignment. And so I understand that because when he calls me to do crazy things like retire from, you know, a career as a financial advisor, it's not, it, it, it's not easy. And I'm sure it's not easy for any of you guys when you know this thing and you're just like, this makes no sense, but I'm going to do it because I know that God is asking me to do it and um so that is what I absolutely love about you <laughs> and and I and I love um it's so funny you and I are very similar my husband's family was farmers we don't have 189 acres wow Wow, that's amazing. So what I wanted to, um, I was kind of looking over um, some questions I, that a couple other people had sent me, but um, I wanted to just kind of ask you this question. Like, if you were put into office, what, what would you do on in your first 30 days? What yeah. would you do to that, that would actually make an impact to the everyday, I like to call it middle America person, um, yeah. you know, because we're such a beautiful, diverse um, state, we really are, and I think most people think of us as either tech world down in Silicon Valley, or they, uh, and for people like myself and you that have lived, I live in Stockton, California now, we're like the fruit basket of America, hardworking um, people. So what for the for the everyday person, what would you do that would tangibly make um, a difference for us? Um, I love it. Such a good question. Well, I, I think the first thing um, that's really, you know, this is essential, is uh, I would suspend the gas tax on day one. And uh, suspending the gas tax would put 51 cents back into the pocket of everybody, every gallon that you fill up at the pump. So if you have a 10 gallon fill up, then you'd have $5 back in your pocket. And uh, the reason that that matters is that as an economics and a growth expert, right, uh, if that $5 goes back into your pocket, um, whether you are driving yourself, or let's say you're um, maybe driving a truck that puts 100 gallons in, and that truck is transporting food, well, all of that money goes back 
into the reduction of the cost of that food. And if we have the same thing for services and the same thing for building supplies, everything gets cheaper. And the only time that you can suspend the gas tax in a state is when you have money to pay for the things that the gas tax otherwise would be paying for. And right now we have an almost $100 billion surplus, which Gavin Newsom has promised to spend almost entirely on one-time spending, which is to me the greatest waste of a generation. And so I will take the money that we have and I will invest it in infrastructure, water and power and roads. Uh, and really, you know, the things that you expect a good government to build for you, but that have been neglected in California in recent decades. Uh, number two, I would end the sanctuary state. The sanctuary state is the uh, law that Jerry Brown put in place that says that if you commit a criminal act and you are here as an undocumented worker, you are not allowed to be reported to the border agencies for deportation. And it harbors criminals in California. Uh, the third thing that I would do is stop Gavin Newsom's prison releases and prison closures. So he's closed two prisons during his tenure and promised to close three more and it executed early release for 76,000 criminals so far in his first term. So if crime has gone up in your area and your neighborhood, if you, you know, have catalytic converters that are being stolen, like they are of driveways everywhere in, uh, in California, if you feel unsafe in a way that you didn't before, um, you can thank Gavin Newsom directly for that. And so I will stop and return us back to a state that prosecutes crime as crime and keeps people in prison if they are supposed to be serving prison terms. We again have a hundred billion dollar surplus. So maybe his actions would make sense if the state was like trying to figure out some way to meet their requirements in a budget. But in a state that has this kind of budget, we should be leading the way in the nation in terms of rehabilitation and creativity for how we reintegrate our uh, prisoners back into society. And if you get early release, it should be because you're working in an oil field and you've been trained for it for three years in prison, or you have a coding degree that you didn't go into prison with, and now you can make $150,000 working for Google when you leave, right? They, they, we have these imaginative programs that we can roll out, but, but we haven't really thought about solving problems in that way. Um, and the final thing that I would do is just champion reforms that are going to be great for business and the economy in California. So right now we pay $800 to license a business. It's 16 times higher than the average of the, um, of, of the country. And most people have, you know, $50 or some states have $9 to license their, um, their, their, their things. If you license a car in California, it's like eight times higher than anywhere else in the country. And so every fee that is passed that is so much higher than other places places a burden on our middle, uh, you know, American, our workforce, our, our kind of um, the most essential people really to California because they're everybody who keeps the clocks running and the, the you know, roads moving and everything happening. And so, um, so those are some of the emergency measures. And then the final thing that I would do is I would turn on the Delta pumps for water. Um, it, you know, I would take office the first week of January, which is supposed to be a high water collection period for California. But for the last two years under Gavin Newsom, he has turned off or severely reduced the Delta pump collection because of the environmental lobby. And they've said, you need to do another study to see if you can still find a fish that we actually think is probably extinct um, and is actually a derivative of other fish. It's not even its own separate species. Um, so it's not really a big deal if it is extinct. Um, and, and we should uh, not have you collect, you know, 90% of the water that otherwise farmers could use. Um, I, I would turn on the Delta pumps and say, you know what, it's, important that we deliver our contracts. And if you want to do studies while the pumps are on, go for it. But right now we're going to deliver the contracts that we have for people. And so uh, I'm a fighter. You know, um, it's important for everybody to know that I am the kind of person who walks into organizations and I'm collaborative. I've, I work with people across the aisle with every different political ideology. I don't combat people for people, but I fight for what I believe is the right thing to do. And I think that the right thing to do in California has gotten very, very lost by the politicians who've been running our state. So those are some of the things that I'd take care of in the first month.
Wow, that is so awesome. So um, I wanted to go back. I'll go in re reverse since you just ended yeah. with um, the, the Delta. You ended with the Delta water, but then you also said something that I think a lot of people don't realize, and this is what I think a skill is. So when you're in the business world, um, in corporate or owning businesses or any of those things, um, myself, I, I know that like you, I mean, I guess you can be like completely, Hey, I'll only see this type of person, but normally if you're going to be a profitable business that you're going to solve or in a high level in the, what I call the C corp, um, you know, leadership level, you have to be a, a good leader means that you're willing to see, solve problems on both sides and you're willing to bring people together and connect. Yeah people. And so I want, um, I wanted to have you expand a little bit on that because to me being around in the business side and why I feel like someone that sometimes I feel the bit people that have come from the business sector, that are the outsiders that go mm -hmm. for things. Um, first of all, they don't realize like they, what you said earlier, Jenny Ray is huge. Like you don't need to do this, you know, and I'm not saying that other people don't have a heart, but there are special skills that you don't even realize when you've been 20 years into something that you have developed. And, and so I felt like I wanted you to just enhance that a little, because I feel like that is something that is super important to be the governor of California, where you're really willing to work with, um, with, with all sectors, not only inside, but outside, right? Like all, all people. So I wanted you, and, and I know because when you're in, if you're going to be successful in the business world and you were mentioning that you like um, speak on multiple campuses, and I don't think people quite caught that about economics, yeah. Um, financial and economics, that's what, so I have a financial background, you, you probably know it, and some people that have seen me, but some people might be watching um, it, we, do, you sometimes don't understand that I don't even understand that skill, when I'll come up with a solution, people will be like, how do you know that, yeah. and so I just think that you've had to learn, if you're going to succeed, and especially as, I'm just going to say it, I hope it's not offensive, but as a female, I, I mean, most people, I know this was my case. I was, I, I was one of the only women in my industry. It was a very highly populated male population. And so you have to learn skills that um, will bring people together, that all voices can be heard. To me, that's what an amazing leader does. Yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that there are two things that I'd love to talk about. <laughs> um, so number one, um, I, I want to make it clear that I'm not talking about looking for consensus. I, I, as the governor, I will use the full power of my office, whether people agree with me or not, because I take an oath to the people of California. So I'm not looking for everybody to get on my page. And I don't need that actually as the governor of California. And I think that's one of the most important things that people need to know about me uh, because other governors have gotten into office and done nothing because they've whined and complained about all the opposition that they receive. I will get things done, whether people think it's a good idea or not, if I believe it's the right thing for the state of California. And I think that there is a piece of leadership that requires that kind of tenacity because sometimes everybody at the beginning doesn't see what you see, right? So I am charged with a vision and a responsibility. And my vision uh, gives me the authority to do five things. Number one, I set the budget in California. We then have to go to the legislature to have it approved. We won't have a budget unless we agree, but I, if I don't put something in the budget, it doesn't go in the budget. And so, you know, what we spend in California comes from my office and comes from my desk. Uh, number two, I have executive orders that I can issue. And so some of the things that I talked about before, whether they were done by executive order and can be undone by executive order or whether they need to be done for the first time, I have the ability to pursue those executive orders. 
Um, I do have a veto and we have a super majority Democrat legislature right now, which is why my main focus in my campaign has never, ever been talking about what Democrats do wrong. I talk about Gavin Newsom as a failed leader and a failed governor of the state. And I talk about the evidence for why that's the case, um, because I will work with Democrats who want to end crime, who want to have a working economy, who want to see businesses succeed, who want remarkable schools. And, and we will work together on those things. And because of that, many of them will either vote with me or no vote on many of the things that we do. And so there will be times when I will be at risk of having a veto overridden. Um, and sometimes I'll still sign things that I know need to be overridden as a message for where I stand. And, and that's okay. That happens in many other legislatures. Um, but what you see in the five states that are blue that have Republican governors is that they find common ground. And I think that's one of the things that you're talking about. Um, I also have the ability to um, set appointments and I have hundreds of appointments in the state. And that is part of the wielding of the power that actually makes some of what having a governor in office so important uh, because Gavin Newsom right now is setting the most progressive judges in place in the country. Um, and so if you want to have the ability to exercise your First Amendment right, good luck in California, right? Because a progressive judge will tell you that that First Amendment right is not absolute. Um, if you want to have Second Amendment rights, if you want to have Fourth Amendment rights, if you want to have uh, you know, rights that are guaranteed to us by our constitution, these judges will tear that down. But not only judges, appointments over water, over power, over the Coastal Commission, over everything that we uh, are bothered by in California. The governor has the leaders of those um, offices to appoint. And I have four years to make culture change inside those organizations. And so, um, and the final one is just my voice, right? The bully pulpit. So, so um, I want to make sure that everybody knows that I'm, what I'm not talking about is only doing the things that Democrats or the supermajority agree to let me do. I'm not talking about that. What I am talking about is having a civil conversation where we don't demonize one another, where we find common ground, and where we work for what is good for the state of California. Sometimes I will work alone most of the time I'm going to work together with people. And sometimes they will work against me. And all of those are a normal part of the process and part of what I've been prepared for. Um, I'm not afraid of it. I will still fight for what I think is the right thing to do for the state, whether or not it is politically expedient or not. I love that. And I think that to me, that's a core value that sometimes people don't realize is actually really needed. And if you have years of experience doing it in um, running your own businesses and working for other high level companies, um, you have to make really hard decisions. And many yeah. times people don't agree with you. And so I love that you kind of really broke that down because honestly, I didn't really know how all of that worked either, but I yeah. think that that part is um, so, so valued to understand. Um, I know you have a hard stop at a certain time. So the one thing I wanted to go back to is when you talked about the Delta, I'll be honest with you, I live right by the Delta and I'm like, okay, I'd never heard this before. And how, yeah. and, and I'm in a farming huge, like I, I live right in San Joaquin County. And, um, you know, I mean, I have like, literally, we just had cherries and blueberries, like right out my backyard is one of the largest packing plants in this area that like flies blueberries even to other play all, all over the place wow. right now. And so I know because I've worked with lots of farmers as clients of mine, that yeah. water actually is a big deal. But I wanted you to explain by doing that, why is that so important? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, water, wildfire, power are things that we sh should, as citizens, be able to ignore. We should actually just trust that our government takes care of them and you can turn on the tap and the water's fine and it's there and it's not expensive and you can turn on your power and it's there and it's not expensive and your house isn't going to burn up because they manage the forests. Like these are all things that we really shouldn't have to worry about as citizens, but because we live in California and because there is a very strong, mostly Hollywood funded environmental lobby. And because of the judges 
that the previous two administrations, Newsom and Brown, have put into place in California, um, the environmental lobby basically will stop any forward action by the legislature and they'll be like oh we need to send that to an environmental review for six months the governor's office is really the only one that can help to expedite that and they've done it for things like stadiums right like building a stadium they have expedited building and um, quality control and environmental review permits. But for other things that don't match up with their agenda, uh, they don't use those expedite powers. And so using the Delta pumps and turning them on is under the authority of the governor's office and under the authority of the appointments that he puts at, for example, the Department of Water Resources. And so um, what we need in California is somebody who wants to manage water for everybody on a five year rolling basis, which is how long our average water cycles that are kind of boom and bust, right? We have really high water periods and then really low water periods. That's how long they usually last. Um, and somebody who thinks about investments for the future. And I'll just run through those really quickly. Investments for the future are better water management tools where we can manage over a five-year period. Right now, we just empty our dams and hope and pray for more water. It's a terrible management plan. Mm. Um, the second thing that we need to do is better water storage. So we need to complete storage projects. We have a few of them that have already been planned in the state, and they are to save water in high water years for release in low water years. Uh, that's the cheapest way we get new water because um, we don't have to create it. We don't have to do anything really to it. The third thing that we need to do is expand our water recycling capacity. Um, and I visited a state of the art in our nation water um, recycling facility in Orange County that other countries have come to study. Um, but we don't do that in every community in California. We don't recycle our water. Um, and finally, desalination, which is the most expensive and the most environmentally unfriendly because you have to deal as you're sucking the water in from the ocean with wildlife, right? So you have whales and dolphins and other things that people really don't want to be affected that are affected by uh, desalination plants. Um, you also need a lot of power for it. And we don't have enough power already in California. So we would need new nuclear power to actually permit um, desalination plants. But it is a possible solution for the longer term future in California. And so, I, you know, I'm open to every technological advancement that we can use to improve our water management system. Uh, what, what needs to happen, though, is a governor that's willing to fight through the red tape and who is not going to just say, oh, sorry, nobody wanted this to happen. You can't have your water, but to say, I got you water and here's how I figured it out. And so, you know, we really need a fighter in Sacramento right now who understands what we need to fight for and how. And that's exactly what I'll do. That's what that's what I love as you're sharing, because I'm like, OK, I don't know. all, And I'm guessing that you probably didn't know all of these things. Either. I didn't know it. No, no. Like I, I went to a, a basement of a church in Fresno. There were about 150 people there. And um, and somebody yelled out, um, turn on the Delta pumps, you know, because they I had a I had a partial plan for water, but it wasn't very fleshed out. And um, and so one of my staffers afterwards went up to him and uh, because in the conversation, I said, it seems like, you know, a lot more than I do about this. I'd love to talk to you afterwards. And so one of my staffers went up to him and said, Jenny Ray would love to sit down with you. You know, when she said that she was genuine and he looked at her and he was shocked and he said, you're serious. I've never, no one has ever said that to me before that they want to learn about the real issues. They've just come and asked for a vote or asked for money. And, and I, I, you know, I have a very sincere interest in actually solving problems in California to, to my benefit or detriment, right? Uh, you know, some politicians just do great by promising never to solve problems or promising to solve them when they don't understand them and then complaining about not being able to get them done later. But, but I care about governance and going back to what I talked about at the beginning, I care about being able to do what I say I will do. And sometimes people will still today ask me about things that I don't know. Somebody asked me this week, would you fire the person who's in this position? I said, do I have the authority to do that? Like, I, I didn't know. It was a very obscure position 
in the state. And so I said, I'm not going to tell you that I can do something if I don't have the authority to do it. And so I, what I say to you matters to me. And I want to be able to say something that I can follow through on. And I think that ultimately that does build trust, but uh, it's, it's unique in this yeah. arena. That's what really stands out to me. And even as I saw research that you did, and as you share what you just happened there, that is to me, the characteristic, which I call an amazing leader, which is humble and says, hey, this person is saying that. I, I don't know. Do I, ha will I have the power and authority? What is this? Let me meet with these people and learn more. And so you take, you know, the ability, the, that ability to leverage people that do, you sit down with them and learn. And so to me, that was what really stands out to me about you is you are willing to have those conversations, learn more. And mm -hmm. um, as you speak on things, even when it was the recall, it was like, wow, I can tell that you, um, you don't just learn that that is a skill when you have um, a set that you like is kind of an important set when you're leading companies, to be honest with you, when you're leading, a, you know, all the things that that pe people do on a high level, but most people don't know that. And to me, that is why I really do believe that you are the person that could make a difference in our state. And um, even though you're the outsider, and to me, that was why I thank you for taking time and ask answering these questions because I feel like sometimes I just want people to be educated to understand what type of person we really need in there are you going to be the expert but what really stands out to me is the fact that you knew to say do I have the authority to do this so instead of saying yes I could do this or no I can't okay well do I even have the authority that I is huge like 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 that's wisdom that's insight and that shows somebody that has dealt with a lot of challenging things in in a business setting where you know okay well you better know if you have the th power and authority like it yeah. doesn't matter if you go promise to all these people and then you turn it out that you don't even have the ability you've got to turn some like someone else's mm -hmm. thing and so to me those little things are the, the, the way you lead are really awesome. So I wanted to just thank you for giving that like detail because we hear about drought. We've had this drought stuff on and off. And so I felt like that was a, a really cool thing that I hadn't heard. Um, I just wanted to end and um, I know that this pro sometimes is a hot topic, but um, it, it's something that we're dealing with right now. And um, just um, around, um, life versus choice movement. Yeah. And I heard when you were interviewed by someone that they called you, <laughs> that you call yourself life plus. And yeah. I was like, but, but I think sometimes when people think that they're thinking you're the person at the picketing place, just yeah. like telling people that they're going to hell. And so I really liked your answer with that. And so I wanted you just end, I know we've got a hard stop in like two minutes, yeah. but I wanted you to just end with that. Cause I really loved what you shared with that. So yeah, on, on some of the hot topics, I, I'll actually expand it to include um, the Second Amendment as well, because I'm very practical, but also very purposeful about both of these things. So, um, I, you know, I believe that life begins at conception. And I had two miscarriages, um, which interestingly, Jody, a lot of people told me that I shouldn't really grieve. It was normal. Like it was only seven weeks. Um, and I recognize that even within our church communities um, in California, a lot of people really don't value life um, until later on in a pregnancy. And I felt like I was sh shocked and surprised by the grief that came over me naturally um, because those were babies. Those were babies with names and futures. And, and, um, and I, you know, I didn't understand the power of grief until I understood the power of life, right? So I, I will fight for life, but um, really in California, our abortion laws are settled law. So whether Roe v. Wade is, um, you know, re revoked or whether it stands, um, you will have the right to an abortion in California. It's something that people have been putting in place for many years as a continued what they believe as protections for choice. Um, 
And so when I say I'm pro-life plus, what that means is that I want to do the things that will invest in women not choosing to have an abortion because they have hope for a future. And so uh, the way that I've saved the lives of babies before is not by shaming anybody, but by having women come to me and say, you are working and you have kids and you seem happy. How's that going for you? Uh, you said to me one time that your um, having kids helped you become a better business person. Can you explain what that looks like to me? And I think that carrying the core value that our kids add to us um, and also propel us in the dreams that we have, the careers that we have, you know, running for governor right now, my kids are I wouldn't do this if it wasn't for my kids. My kids are my why. And, um, and so, you know, um, what does that look like really practically? Number one, um, the message that teenage girls get today is if you have a baby, you're going to drop out of high school and be a failure. You should get an abortion. So our new message would be, um, Hey, if you have a baby, we'll help you finish high school. You can do it remotely. Um, what, what do we want to, what do you want to do and how can we help you? Right. And so um, it may, maybe they'll continue to choose abortion because they'll have the right to do that. But if, if we can help um, women actually solve the societal issues like becoming a high school dropout, then that's going to make a difference in the future. Um, the second thing is age zero to three child care. Uh, I've asked many churches in the state, right, what do you do for um, single moms in your community? And they're like, oh, we have like a single mom day, you know, <laughs> right? There's not a lot that they're doing. And I said, what if you opened up a like free or subsidized childcare facility for single moms? And you can income qualify them, do whatever you need to do, but wouldn't that be really meaningful so that moms in age zero to three, when it's really hard to find affordable childcare, have a safe place for their babies to go? Maybe that would change the nature of. Um, your abortion statistics in your community. And so um, we can subsidize those kinds of programs uh, in partnership with nonprofits and with um, government institutions in the state. Uh, and the third thing that we can do is just advance uh, vocational training. We actually really need nurses and law enforcement officers and plumbers, and women are amazing at a lot of these careers, um, but they, they often can't go through the training because of the timing or the childcare burden of it. And so we can pay for that as the state. And so there are things that I wanna do that really will advance opportunities for women um, in our workforce and make it easier for them to choose life, despite the fact that abortion will remain legal. Um, and really, you know, gun control is the next thing. And I'll just end with this. Uh, my kids are in public school. A 100% of the time when I go to pick them up, I want them to be there, right? I, I have absolutely zero tolerance for gun violence in schools. I, I have no interest in perpetuating anything in our culture that I believe will aid gun violence. But when we talk about gun violence, the conversation for politicians always goes to guns and never to violence. And I think that we need to really examine what has changed in the last 20 to 25 years. And it is a root cause of a sick culture that glorifies violence for people who are bullied, isolated, and alone. And that is an issue that I would like to invest in. And so I am focusing on investing in school safety and also in making sure that kids that are at risk of becoming the next shooters are not isolated and alone. They're not playing violent video games uh, when they're 13 years old. They're not focused on um, bullying access through social media. Um, we really do need to have stronger age gating for violent pornography. There are a lot of things that are very loosely gated in our society and guns are not one of them. In California, you have to wait 10 days to get guns. You have to do a background check for ammunition. You, there's a ban on assault weapons in California. So, you know, we don't really have a gun problem in California. We have a violence issue. And, and I just want to be very clear about that um, because I used to be very strongly on the side of gun control. Um, and, and as I look at the data and the information, I see um, that the places that have the strongest gun control actually have some of the highest rates of gun violence uh, because gun control works on non-criminals, but not for criminals. And, uh, and that, it, it sucks, but it's true. 
Um, and so we can either pretend that we're doing something or we can do the real things that take hard work to make a difference for our kids in our future. And because I've got kids in school that I want to pick up every day safely, uh, mm -hmm. I want to do the hard work to make a difference. And so, um, yeah, life and um, the Second Amendment are both things that I support, but those are my practical approaches to both of them. That's what I love. And it's actually things that I've thought of too, because like I've seen practical times with kids that I know like are amazing. And then all of a sudden the video games, I've, like I, and um, you see something change and it's like, okay, there, there's a core root problem on the violence. Like, why are we not looking for that? And then I love what you said, even how, I mean, I know it's not a fun thing to say, but you were talking to the churches because that's what my thought is like, how can we be solutions? How can we help this problem? So, because we know what it is, why that is a choice. They think that they're going to throw their career away. They're going to throw um, everything that, away and so a lot of times there's nothing else so I that's what really stood out to me even in your answers they're always very thought out and what can we do to actually make a change and sometimes it's from an underline like activating things in our state not just shouting from the rooftop so I know you've got to run it's been so amazing thank you for taking this time and um, I am going to be voting on Tuesday and I will be checking the ballot for you of course thank you thank you and so much, um, I just yeah I just hope if somebody is watching this and on a place where you got it sent share this um, just if, if you like what she's saying um, I've never been a person that shoves things down down their throat but I've been asking what how exactly I live in California what can be my part so my thought yeah. was let me offer to host this um I know it's she said I could do it Saturday at nine I said let's go for it so thank you so much Jenny and we hey, are Jenny. cheering for you so um how can people learn more about you yeah um so uh, you know I'll put this in the video but we could also Kind of um just you know send it along with everybody but um i have a website jenny ray c a j e n n y r a e c a dot com um you can um go on there you can from there email me you can donate uh you can look up all my issues and um so happy to to um, find me there and then that same handle um jenny ray c a and i'll just put like kind of at um is on instagram facebook uh, Twitter, uh, TikTok. So you can find me on a lot of the social channels as well. Awesome. And you know, I just want to throw one last thing out. If somebody is, I have a lot of people that follow me from all over and states that are, you know, different than ours, yeah. support her campaign. Like yeah, you can give. We can, you can still give. Yeah, a way that you could say, because California really is the kind of the hub for everything in our entire country. So I understand it might not feel like your problem, but if, if that can be a way that you could help too, is just by supporting her campaign so that she can um, continue. Share this with somebody you know in California. Maybe you moved out of California, but you may know somebody that can vote in the primary elections. So go vote in the primary elections. Jenny, thank you so much. Thank you. And, um, I'm gonna go ahead and hit um, end record.